S compatibility investigations of autonomous vehicles with current passenger vehicles. You have all came into the meeting muted and uh, the meeting muted and would appreciate if you stayed muted until the Q&A section. Uh, captions will be on for your convenience. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them in the chat box uh, and they will be addressed at the end. At this time, I would like to introduce the presenters. Uh, Dr. Chiara Silvers III Dobrovoni uh, directs research for various state departments of transportation, Federal Highway Administration, Road Safety Pooled Fund Group, and University of Transportation Center that designs and tests roadside safety hardware and fiscal security systems to improve the safety of transportation. She specializes in the field of structures with an emphasis on occupant protection and highway safety. Her active research includes finite element methods applied to different fields from impact and structural mechanics to bio uh, medical, uh, sorry, biomechanical applications. Dr. Dobrovoni's research aimed to re reduce, aimed at reducing the risk of injury and in motor vehicle crashes by investigating the causes and patterns of injury in real world crashes and performing compute, compute, computational uh, simulations to evaluate the human mechanical responses to mechanical loading. Uh, she actively serves on key national committees focused on roadway safety and occupant risk and provides strategic guidance for purpose statement de definition and strategic planning for associations and institutes she is a part of. I will now pass it over to Dr. Dobrovonis uh, to introduce her student, Anaruda. Well, thank you so much, Eric. Can you hear me well? I can hear you just fine. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric, for an introduction. And thank you, um, everyone, for the interest to um, this uh, webinar. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate with this webinar. Um, I have uh, actually my graduate research assistant, Aniru Zalani, that uh, will co-present it with me. Um, so I'll briefly start with the presentation and uh, then I will uh, let him go through uh, most of the background and the objective of the project and, uh, and then I will finish up with the conclusions. Um, again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, the webinar um, today is for a discussion of a project on crash compatibility of automated vehicles with passenger vehicles. Uh, before we start with the background, I'd like to move on with the acknowledgements and uh, I'd like to um, recall that this project was funded by the Safety uh, uh, UTC, National, um, National University Transportation Center, uh, which is a grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation. I'd like to especially thank my co-authors, Anirud Zalani, uh, who's going to be talking next, and also Gretchen Stolcher from TTI, who has been supportive with uh, uh, information regarding uh, activities with uh, uh, automated vehicles. Um, also, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that the final element models of the vehicles that were used within uh, these study and simulations uh, have been developed by the uh, George Mason University CCSA, the Center for Collision Safety. And last but not least, I also would like to acknowledge that uh, the simulations that were conducted throughout this project were, um, were, were conducted through the use of the supercomputers from the Texas A&M University High Performance Research Computer. With that said, I first would like to um, invite Anirud to present himself. Anirud has been a graduate student working on this project, uh, which has also been his master thesis. And he just recently graduated with his master's degree and is now uh, working with his PhD degree as well here at, TT, at, at TMU, um, working still with us at TTI. Um, so Anirud, um, please. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me, Dr. Kiara? Yes, very well. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, so for today's discussion, I would like to first start by providing a background information of automated vehicles its types, and the crash testing procedure that was followed. Then defining the objective and methodology of the research, 
followed by a discussion of results obtained. Finally, concluding this presentation by providing the recommendations based on the results. So experiments with traditional vehicles have been done as early as the 19th century. The first self-sufficient and truly automated vehicle appeared in 1980s at the Carnegie Mellon University. And since then, various vehicle manufacturing companies such as Mercedes, General Motors, Toyota, Volvo have been working to bring some sort of autonomy in their vehicles. In 2013 was the first time an autonomous vehicle was allowed in public roads in traffic and since then, it has been a goal of companies to invest more in this field that requires minimum human intervention. Even more so, the governments in European countries and some Asian countries have set up rules and regulations for automated vehicles to be deployed in public. As of 2019, in US, 29 states have passed laws permitting automated vehicles. Moreover, COVID-19 has accelerated the adoption of automated vehicles as a reliable and safe method for moving goods between warehouses, supplying medical supplies and food to healthcare professionals in the affected areas via the contactless delivery options. The automated vehicle technology has various advantages such as accessible transportation to people with disabilities, reduced travel time and transportation costs and fuel savings. Most of these vehicles will be electric, electrically operated thus will reduce the CO2 emissions. And most important of all these vehicles are expected to reduce the traffic and related crashes. Now, various terms such, uh, such as self-driving and autonomous are used interchangeably. However, as per the Society of Automotive Engineers, an autonomous vehicle word is reserved for vehicles that are capable to drive with command and have the ability to take their own decisions. Hence, for the purpose of this project, we will be using automated or self-driving as the wording. So according to SAE, which is Society of Automotive Engineers, they have classified the vehicles into six classifications based on level zero to level five. So level zero is a weak type of vehicle in which there is no uh, autonomy and the driver has to perform all the tasks. Level one and level two are the most common vehicles that are being observed nowadays. Uh, which involve some active safety systems such as a, uh, traction control, electronic stability, anti-lock braking systems and more. Level three are those that include options such as autopilot in Tesla, adaptive cruise control, lane centering capability, traffic sign recognition system. But it still requires a human driver to be present and take actions as needed. Level four and level five are the two uh, automated vehicle and which are based uh, with the combination of uh, technologies such as the artificial intelligence, LIDAR and radar. So for this discussion, we will be focusing on the no occupant automated vehicles, which are equipped with these uh, automated driving system technologies. So the word no occupant here means that we these vehicles will primarily be used for the transport of goods uh, rather than the passenger. So now I would like to talk about some of the existing automated vehicles. So the first one is Neuro, which is a startup company based in California. The name of the model is Neuro R2. These, the, these vehicles have been used solely for the purpose to deliver goods. So this is the only company that has been currently allowed by the NHTSA, that is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to operate on public roads. They currently run in Houston for Domino's delivery. Since this vehicle is used only for the goods delivery, there is no occupant compartment. And this vehicle has dimensions uh, which is narrower and taller compared to a passenger vehicle, making it a bullet shaped structure. The second company is Ironride Pod. So this is a Swedish based company that uh, is level four technology and is mostly used for transporting of uh, wooden logs and uh, large uh, goods. This also does not include any occupant compartment and has a capability to reach up to 53 miles per hour. The third company is Zooks, which is an Amazon based company and that has been developed in December, 2020. Uh, this, this is also uh, a vehicle which does not involve a driver compartment and is intended to be used for both passengers and goods. This can go up to a max speed of 75 miles per hour and can weigh as, as, high, as 
uh, heavy as 5,400 pounds. So now, as I mentioned up until now, these automated vehicles come up with various state-of-the-art technologies and sensors that make them far superior compared to the human-driven traditional vehicle. So now the question arises, why do we even need to have a crash testing of these vehicles? Aren't these equipped with technologies to avoid any crash? So IHS, which is the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, has conducted a recent study in which it has found that these vehicles will only be able to avoid one third of crashes which are caused by human error. Moreover, NHTSA has made it mandatory for these automated vehicle companies to consider the crash worthiness compatibility. It has also been seen a lot of accidents with the automated uh, technology and some of them proved to be fatal. So since these ADS vehicles will be operating uh, among the other passenger vehicles, there we need to consider the crash compatibility of those automated vehicles with the passenger vehicle. So the next thing I would like to talk is the crumple zone. One of the key difference between the normal passenger vehicle and a no occupant automated vehicle is the absence of crumple zone. A crumple zone, also known as a crush zone or a deformation zone, is a part in the vehicle that is designed to take out the kinetic energy of a moving vehicle in a controlled way. The main purpose is to redistribute and minimize the forces to protect the passengers in the occupant compartment. As per the Newton's second law of motion, which is force equals to mass into acceleration. One way to reduce this impact force is by increasing the time it takes for the vehicle to stop, which lowers the acceleration. This is exactly what a crumple zone does as it adds the time by absorbing the energy. In the event of a crash, the kinetic energy of the impacting vehicle is first absorbed by the materials and converted to the elastic potential energy as long as the stress is within the limit. The goal of crumple zone is to lower this elastic potential energy either by making the material fracture, which is basically converting into thermal energy. This is one of the reasons why the front and back of a vehicle are made up of cheaper materials and vehicles are usually totaled after a crash. Even the race cars use a honeycomb structure that breaks into pieces and usually the race driver is unharmed. And usually for the uh, side, we don't have any uh, crumple zone. So the next thing I want to talk about is the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. So it is a non-profit research organization funded by insurance companies in the United States that is dedicated to reduce the deaths and injuries through research and evaluation. It has a VRC, which is the Vehicle Research Center headquartered in Virginia, which they perform where they perform all the crash tests. Uh, they have a set of defined protocols to test the crashworthiness performance of vehicles and give ratings based on these. So they have multiple tests such as the frontal, side, rear impact, head restraint, roof strength and headline. However, for the purpose of this discussion, we will be focusing on the front and side impact. And they evaluate it based on the crashworthiness and the crash avoidance. So for this discussion, we will be considering the crashworthiness compatibility based on which they give classifications such as good, acceptable, marginal, and poor. So IHS conducts its side impact testing to determine the side crashworthiness compatibility of vehicles. This is one of the most critical scenario as there is no crumple zone for side of the vehicles. The general configuration consists of a stationary test vehicle, which is impacted by a movable deformable barrier at 90 degrees also known as a T-bone crash. MDB, is a, which is movable deformable barrier, is a representation of a passenger vehicle that deforms uh, just as like a crumple zone of a vehicle. So IRD, another term that I want to define here is the IRD, which is the impact reference distance, uh, is the location of the point of impact of the movable deformable barrier from the front axle. Wheel bay, uh, from, uh, which is based on the wheelbase. So, for example, uh, the wheelbase, if the wheelbase of a vehicle is less than 250 centimeter, then the impact reference distance will be, will be 144.8. So, for determining the structural rating of a vehicle, IHS has side impact evaluation criteria that calculates the amount of intrusion that occurs at the occupant compartment. So, the distance between the B pillar intrusion and the center line of the seat pan is used to determine what zones will 
uh, the ratings fall into, which is usually given as red, orange, yellow, and green. So the figure on the left is the top view of a seat, and on the right is the back view of the vehicle compartment. So the thing to note here is that lesser is the distance between the intrusion, lesser is the in distance between the center line and the B pillar. The uh, more will be the intrusion of the impacted vehicle, and that will cause more injuries to the occupant. The other uh, criteria that was evaluated was the front impact test from IHS. There are two configurations of this test: the moderate overlap and the small overlap. For both of these configurations, it involves a test vehicle traveling at 40 miles per hour towards a stationary aluminium honeycomb barrier. For the moderate overlap, the barrier is at an offset of 10% of the vehicle width from the vehicle center line. The vehicle width is actually the distance between the widest part of the vehicle, excluding the side view mirrors. Similarly, for the small overlap, the offset distance is 25% uh, of the test vehicle width, traveling at again the same 40 miles per hour. So in a real life, this situation represents a vehicle approaching towards each other at 40, just under 40 miles per hour each. So for the evaluation criteria, IHS selects multiple measuring locations to calculate the intrusion of the different areas during the impact. All of these locations lie in front of the legs of the occupant sitting inside the vehicle. The image on the left is the backside view and on the right is the side view of a vehicle. All of these distances are measured from the driver door striker, which is located as shown in this figure. First, the free impact distance is calculated. And after that, the innermost point of these locations is selected to calculate the post impact deformation. Finally, based on the difference between the pre and post impact, the level of intrusion is deter determined to give the ratings. So these are some of the rating criteria that is given based on the intrusion value for both the small, moderate and small overlap. Each individual location is given a rating and then they're combined at the end to give the overall rating of the configuration. For example, usually the tow pan is farthest from the occupant and as a week in the vehicle and therefore has more intrusion limit as compared to something like the instrument panel, which uh, is right in front of the legs. Now moving towards the objective of this research. So all the criteria that I mentioned above are applicable for the regular passenger vehicle. However, these automated vehicles are different compared with the passenger vehicles in three respects. The first is that they do not have an occupant compartment and snow crumple zone. The second is these vehicles have different geometrical characteristics, such as the width and height of the vehicles. Like the Neuro R2 that I mentioned had a more bullet shaped structure. Third, since these vehicles will be electric in nature, they will be having higher mass compared with the combustion engine vehicle. So the main objective of this research was to investigate the crash compatibility of these no occupant automated vehicles with passenger vehicles through computer simulations. At the same time, propose an alternate location of impact for the side impact configuration and see how the results vary. Now, uh, the next will be methodology and uh, it will be given by Dr. Chiara. So. Thank you, Aniruda. Can you hear me back? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, well, um, after Aniruda went through the background and the, method and the, the objective, uh, um, I'm going to speak uh, with respect to the methodology of the project that we work on and then illustrate our results. And uh, um, we'll have time uh, for some uh, uh, result uh, evaluation and uh, comments. Um, so with respect to the methodology, what we did in this project, uh, and it's gonna be more clear within the next few slides and more visual, uh, we have used existing vehicle models um, from a finite element uh, computer uh, simulation. And uh, we have used it in conjunction with existing crash standards or protocols. Uh, um, we then, uh, um, investigate and select the specific impact conditions and location to try to identify what it might be the critical case for the different situations. And we did conduct these FEA, finite element analysis simulations, 
uh, with the scope to evaluate occupant compartment deformations. Again, occupant compartment of the vehicle that has been impacted. And uh, obviously we have used these results to compare with respect to the different impact mode. You see there are a couple of them that have been investigated. Uh, but before we go into the various uh, impact modes that we investigated, I'd like to spend a couple of slides uh, to just to talk about uh, the final element modeling and uh, uh, vehicle models that we uh, have used for this project. Like I mentioned before, this model is actually really come from the um, George Mason University, CCSA, Center for Collision Safety, um, and uh, they uh, have used uh, um, existing models like you will see in the, the next slides more details, which then we have used to con conduct our simulations. Uh, the software that we have used uh, is a software that we normally uh, use all the time in the type of work that we perform. Uh, normally we do investigate road safety hardware and so we use either LS proposed and LS Dyna software for a pre-post processing and of course conducting the simulations and that's really used in terms of a design aid. Uh, which could be designed for a safety system or like in this case for a, a vehicle uh, design as well. Uh, the vehicles that we have used uh, are specifically passenger vehicles and so really two type of class of passenger uh, vehicles um, and which is the passenger car and the pickup truck we'll see that next but also three different sizes of autonomy uh, finite element vehicle models. These models were uh, calibrated against existing IHS uh, testing requirements and also NCAP, NHTSA NCAP testing requirements. And they were developed by making sure that the, the, the general of course geometry, but also the material properties reflect what's, uh, what's in real life. Again, it's very important to understand that uh, every time that we are using FEA, it's a great tool for us when we design something and to identify potential issues and maybe how we can approach them, but it will never be really a full replacement of the testing or you know, physical testing in general, full scale or not. So within the next slide, we're going to look into what are uh, what was the methodology that uh, George Mason University have followed to develop these models of the non-occupant uh, ADS systems, so the automated systems. Um, basically, what they did, they actually uh, used reverse engineering through existing passenger vehicles that use existing models, like, for example, the Toyota Yaris that you see on the bottom left of the screen, and they have modified that. The first thing they did, they was a, a really extrapolate what is called, what they call the skateboard type chassis. They modified it to have of the dimension that was the representative dimension of the specific ABS model. And there has been some changes that had to be applied, like, for example, of course, taking away the um, occupant seats, uh, you know, a lot of uh, these occupant compartment uh, material that it's normally used for passenger vehicles, but now we're talking about no occupant systems. It's not needed and there is, there is no, um, no design for them uh, in these ABS models. They also had to replace the engine and the uh, passive storage systems and place a battery pack and motor in the, car, in the cargo space. Um, as for... Um, the optional cargo, for example, uh, in, the, in the model that we actually see in the, in the slides uh, on the bottom right, um, that there was some uh, optional cargo that was added because that specific ADS model was to uh, transport goods. And that's very important to model the cargo as well because uh, cargo will have an influence obviously not only on the weight itself of the, of the vehicle, but also the um, location of the CG, which in turn might have some uh, consideration during the impact. Uh, within the next two slides, uh, um, we just wanted to show basically the final element models. I'm not going to spend uh, too much time on that. It's there if you would like to go back and review uh, even later on when the presentation is going to be available. But uh, the first two models are really models of uh, the passenger vehicles uh, that uh, are normally used for roadside safety investigation. 
those are the two passenger, uh, those are the two passenger vehicle, passenger car and pickup truck, where the pickup truck usually um, basically represents an SUV type of vehicle. Um, the next uh, three models uh, are the three models that were developed uh, to replicate uh, the no occupant ADS vehicles. Um, you can see that, and Aniru did already touched on that at the very beginning of the presentation, there are uh, really uh, three major um, systems that were, or vehicles that were developed to replicate uh, some sort of three different classes. The first one appears to be much smaller. You'll see in a second how all these dimensions are going to be uh, looking when you know next to each other. Uh, the second one is a it's really a mid-size ABS model, and the third one is more of a larger size ABS model. Uh, with that said, um, let's move into the uh, identified crash scenarios that we identified as critical and we wanted to replicate and more investigate. Keep in mind, please, that this study was really more of a pilot study. So there's certainly a lot of improvement can be done. And this was really done to try to identify whether there is a, an issue or something that needs to be addressed as these ADS vehicle are, you know, potentially being implemented on the roadway, like it's been already happening in the past few years. This slide identified a scenario of the side impact. Uh, 90 degree impacts of one vehicle against a stationary vehicle. So from this, from now on, the blue vehicle, which is a passenger vehicle, is the stationary vehicle that is always being impacted. The question is, uh, by what is impacted and where and what are the results? Really, that's what it comes to. In this specific photo, but we'll see the matrix in a moment, in the specific photos of rendering, we have uh, the smallest autonomous vehicle in red that is impacted at the location of the B pillar, which is a more in line uh, to what the testing uh, have been conducted nowadays uh, when investigating the crashworthiness compatibility. The small size ADS as a side, uh, as a, uh, side impact speed nominal impact speed of 25 miles per hour because it's uh, generally, that's the considered limitation of that specific vehicle. Um, but when involving other vehicles, like you'll see later on in a bigger matrix, we went on uh, uh, to 30 miles an hour, and, uh, which is again more in line to what the normal BIHS does in uh, their testing protocols. Um, Picture on the left represented the impact at the B pillar. You can see on the top left, but picture on the right represent uh, a, an impact that has been uh, purposely moved from the B pillar, and is in this case specifically decided to be at mid span between the A pillar and the B pillar. Um, both of them are basically impacting at the occupant compartment. However, what was the strategy here? Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, um, we wanted to highlight whether there are any differences in the uh, occupant compartment deformations as we move the impact point to other locations that might or may not engage region components of the occupant compartment. So let's see what, what that means. Um, the next slide that shows uh, crash scenarios, uh, uh, as Anirud was showing, uh, explaining in the beginning, of the frontal impact. So now we go from a side to a front, it's gonna be both moderate, moderate overlap and small overlap. Um, the next slide shows that the computers, actually the next two slides that show the computer simulation metrics. Again, we don't need to necessarily go through every single detail here. However, I wanted, and Anirudh, you can help me with that. I wanted to highlight that in the first slide where we have all the metrics of the side impact, you can see the Yaris, the blue car, is always the stationary that is impacted. But you can see when you go from a small ADS to a mid-size to a large size to the two passenger vehicles, Yaris and Silverado, which is what normally technically we most likely see nowadays, right, on the road, because that's normally we have passenger vehicles nowadays on the road. It's interesting to see just visually how these dimensions are different. And I just wanted you to note, and we'll see next in some simulations, how um, the small side ADS, the red one on the top, is a very 
small in dimensions, very narrow. I shouldn't say small, but it's very narrow and more pointing. That's just the nature of the, the, the vehicle, uh, how it was designed. Um, Next, please. So this is just a continuation, yes, of the of the metrics, uh, and uh, so now we're looking to the results. Um, so I have some videos that are gonna uh, run uh, later on in a second, but first I wanted to make some comments so that you, um, when you when you view the videos of the simulations, uh, you are able to critically understand or remember, you know, what I was mentioning, you know where to look at. So when we look at, remember when we look at side impact deformation, as Anirudh mentioned at the beginning of the simulation, we are really looking into how much the occupant compartment is deformed. Uh, could be around the location of the B pillar or a A, B pillar, so between the two for the side impact um, case. Um, so uh, when again next slide when you when you are gonna see the the simulation next, uh, I wanted to give you some heads up. Uh, um, it looks like and again we don't need to go into all the numbers over here. But what I wanted to do with this slide, what I wanted to do with the slides is to show by just the color coding, which are recalling the current evaluation criteria from the IHS to evaluate the crashworthiness compatibility. It was just to highlight whether, whether there might be something that make us think with respect to this crashworthiness compatibility. So the question was, uh, do we see any differences in the type, in the type of, um, uh, or do we see any differences with respect to the occupant compartment deformation of the passenger vehicle that has been impacted? So the blue Yaris. Uh, depending on the vehicle that is impacted and depending on the location where it's impacted, whether on the B pillar or on the A B pillar. What this slide is show really is that, well, all of them are really acceptable options in this case, or results, I should say. However, we see we have already a step from a green to a yellow, meaning a step into more and more deformation that we see within the compartment. It's not really intrusion, actually, it's more of a deformation. And the reason is, and that happens, especially you can see on the uh, right column, which is when the vehicle is impacting the Yaris in between the A and B pillar. Why so? Well, that's really related on the level of engagement. So next slide, please. The level of engagement where of the impacting vehicle with respect to the structure of the occupant compartment of the Yaris. And uh, um, we, we wanted to kind of visually replicate this, uh, although I, I think it's already well understood from the, the pictures that we were showing before, and you'll see in a video in the next slide. But um, if you look at the middle case, when we have small side ADS impacting the Yaris, you can see that the red, which is at the pretty much impact vehicle area, so the level of engagement that the impacting vehicle is pushing and deforming the impacted vehicle, the Yaris, you can see that it is a more concentrated instead of being a, a spread, uh, uh, you know, more on the occupant compartment. But most important, what it is, uh, is that uh, for uh, in specific cases like the small side ADS, there could be the, ch the chance, there could be the case where um, the level of engagement is uh, not um, addressing, or uh, even better, the, the vehicle itself is not engaging maybe the A and B pillar, which are normally the more structural components and less prone to the form. Not that they couldn't deform absolutely, but they are you know less prone to the form than, for example, the door. So that's really what our intent within this project was to try to understand what is the engagement, how is that. Um, result for, you know, the Kirschwortenis compatibility that we were talking about. And I believe the next slide is actually the slide of the simulation. So there are a few simulations here. So Anirudh, maybe you can show the first top left and right. This, the simulations are the side impact at the B pillar. What I'd like you to notice is that the deformation of the um, occupant compartment of the blue car, which is, uh, um, uh, which is a, still deformed, but is somehow contained. 
at least you can see that. And you can compare now with uh, the bottom left where we have a normal, what well, I call a normal, just to the passenger car against the same passenger car. So the two level of deformations are very similar. Now you might have more momentum. And so, you know, the, the, the blue car is pushed more, but that's not, a, not, that's not an issue. What we're looking at is the deformation of the aquifer compartments. And the same thing is when we have a mid-size of the ADS on the bottom right impacting the um, Yaris. Um, yeah, you might have, again, more momentum, um, uh, but at the same time, uh, you have an overall uniform uh, deformation of the aquifer compartments. And that's mostly because you are engaging that B pillar. So now, in the next slide, uh, you're going to see how that differs uh, when we are moving the, the, the location of impact. So in the first case on the top is when the small size at yes is impacting the passenger vehicle, but now we're going between A and B pillar. And I know that um, this is a top view, so you'll see that the vehicle is kind of turning a little bit, so it might seem to intrude more than what it really is. It actually does not intrude, but that's just the, 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 the that, that's what it looks like because of the type of view. But, uh, but really the point is you can see clearly that there is a more deformation of the occupant compartment of the Yaris, and that's because uh, very simply, that specific uh, um, small size ADS, uh, it, it's more narrow within the design and it's not engaging in a strong point in the occupant compartment to keep that from happening. So what, obviously what we wanted to do, and it, remember all of these unfortunately could not really be calibrated against the full scale testing, which is actually one of the limitation and also future work that we, we would suggest if you know, anyone is interested in proceeding with uh, this type of investigation. So the best that we could do is actually use an existing model. So like the bottom left, the normal passenger vehicle that we're using and try to replicate the same condition and see what happened. Again, not worry too much about the fact that the blue vehicle is pushed away, but look how the, um, the passenger vehicle impacting, so the, the, the green one, I guess, uh, it's engaging, it has a more of a uniform deformation, uh, creates more of a uniform deformation on the blue car because it's really engaging multiple aspects of the car compartment, A pillar and B pillar at the same time, even if we have moved the location in between the doors. And uh, last but not least on the bottom right is the same situation, but now we're looking into a larger AV. Even in this case, uh, um, the, uh, still we have to say that it looks like the, the formation of the blue car is more uniform and uh, because of the, really because of the dimension and less pointing, I guess, uh, um, characteristics of the AV itself. I want to make sure that it's very clear that has, this has nothing to do with the fact that uh, one is an autonomous vehicle and another one is a vehicle that is driven by a human. Uh, this is purely an investigation that is done on uh, the crashworthiness compatibility among uh, the geometry, the geometrical characteristics of these vehicles. Now that is automated vehicle or not, has nothing to do with that. Um, the next slide, so, so now we talk about the uh, side impacts and the, the last few slides are going to be uh, summarizing the results of the um, frontal impact, either moderate or small overlap. Um, so the top left uh, picture is really a rendering of what are basically the passenger vehicle that is impacted, but also what are the components uh, of uh, the top and side uh, occupant compartments and some of the uh, characteristics, for example, like the in instrument panel, steering column or footrest, brake pedal that, uh, you know, we are, uh, we are looking uh, from a deformation perspective. On the right, uh, the three photos or the three rendering that you see, the three print screen, are the results of the impacted vehicle deformation. So now what we have is, we have three cases, right? We wanted to compare the three cases. One is the moderate overlap between the two passenger vehicles, as we all know them. Uh, the other one is the moderate overlap now between a small ABS vehicle and the passenger, the one in the middle. And the third one is uh, 
the moderate overlapped impact between a, a mid-size AV with a D passenger vehicle. Uh, it, it, it's, it shows already that um, if you compare, for example, the top with the middle one, you can see how the deformation of the passenger vehicle, the blue one, the one technically that is impacted, although both of them, they have speed, uh, presents a deformation that is more uniform with respect to the, the front um, because there is more engagement. Uh, but now when we talk about the middle case with the blue, uh, I'm sorry, with the red small ADS vehicle, there is more concentration of forces towards the side of the, the corner, I should say, I'm sorry, the corner of the vehicle. And it seems like it's pushed a little more inside, right? And, uh, and then the third one, again, it's more of a comparison. Uh, keep in mind that the third case uh, as an involve, involves a mid-size ADS that is considerably bigger passenger vehicle. So we do expect to see, you know, more deformation. But what is really interesting is, again, from a color coding perspective, without that we really look into a lot of, you know, numbers and compare numbers, if we color code on the bottom left, the measuring location, so basically the evaluation criteria, we can see how very interesting the case of the impact between the mid-size ADS, which is the smallest out of pretty much all of them, with a, a smaller uh, force, basically, um, or technically smaller force, it presents, uh, uh, from a color coding perspective, a level of uh, um, deformation. I don't want to call it really intrusion, right? because actually it's not an intrusion. The level of deformations that are higher than the other two cases, where technically we maybe would expect more. And uh, we attribute that to the, the geometry itself. The next slide is a very similar slide, so we might be a little bit quicker over here. It's a small overlap, um, so there is, more of, there is a smaller overlap between the two impacting vehicles during a frontal crash. Always the same three cases, always the same comparison. And again, it seems like also in this case, the mid, the, the mid size and small size, they, this, this has, actually in this case, the small size doesn't create a too much problem, or at least don't want to call it problem, but doesn't seem to potentially create more intrusion. And again, we attribute that to the fact that this is a small overlap. So it's really, actually move it, move it away from the vehicle. Um, but certainly for the mid-size, we can see more deformation, which also could be attributed, of course, to um, a bigger, you know, um, force because it's a bigger size vehicle. So with that said, the next couple of slides show some videos uh, of the moderate, the first one is the moderate overlap. That's a passenger vehicle with another passenger vehicle, the same vehicles. Uh, how they would perform when they're impacting according to this moderate overlap. Um, what I would like you to do is uh, um, you know, really nothing new than what we probably would expect. I mean, it's still a crash at, you know, a pretty considerable speed. But what I would like you to uh, pay attention is uh, during this video, maybe I need to even run it again, maybe a couple of times, uh, um, you can see how the occupant compartment is, uh, especially on the right video, the one with the mid size, is pushed in. So, um, and again, in this case, of course, so uh, one could make the comment that this is more of a mid size ABS, but these are just a representative because we saw the color coded number before, where you know we we did have some, uh, um, you know, potential consideration uh, with respect to the small size. Uh, the next videos are the small overlap video, so very similar. Uh, it's just that really the location is placed, is moved a little bit uh, towards the outside of the vehicles. Again, it's uh, always very interesting to see how, you know, these vehicles are responding to each other. And so I hope that by now it's kind of clear what the crash coordinates compatibility um, you know, terminology uh, represents that, you know, we have started with and we have used throughout this presentation. Uh, well, we are at the point where we are uh, ready to make some conclusion or go through the conclusion of, uh, no, I'm sorry, one, a uh, couple of more slides, I forgot, I apologize. Um, when we conducted this project, 
uh, we obviously are very well aware that this type of uh, physical testing, all of these are through simulations, but you know, physical testing that normally are done uh, either through NCAP or the IHS you know, the, or other testing agency, uh, generally, not always, but generally, especially the IHS and the NCAP, uh, to look into crash work and its compatibility and to look into crash work of the occupant compartments of vehicles are using instrumented dummies because they use the instrumented dummies to evaluate what are the occupant risk and try to identify, number one, you know, if it's considered that the, the results of the test is considered safe so that basically it's a good design of the vehicle or if there are certain locations so that can be improved from a design perspective. Now, uh, from uh, our perspective, um, we certainly wanted to include the dummy, and we did, and we'll see in a second uh, some cases, but um, coming from a roadside safety barrier investigation, we, do, we did decide uh, um, as an uh, extra check, I guess, uh, for, for lack of better wording, to utilize uh, what we call a, a test risk assessment program. Basically what it is, uh, is in, utilize a surrogate methodology where we evaluate or determine the occupant risk for this impact, not necessarily by including a um, instrumented dummy, but uh, by using um, accelerometer. So, recording information from the vehicle accelerometer in Ray Jaros that is located at the CG of the vehicle. It's a common thing that we do in our area and we can use it knowing that we have certain limits. So in this case, for example, what we did when we ran these impacts, we had accelerometer located at the CG of our vehicles and then we basically process the results that we obtain to determine what we call the occupant input velocity and the right down acceleration. I'm not going to go too much in detail, you know, be happy to if you need me, but you know, the, really the, the point is that both of these aspects dictate occupant risk. They have limits. These limits Pretty much I can say that these limits represent serious injuries. So we wanna stay within those limits and uh, the limits for the OIV um, and, and the acceleration were you know, fairly met throughout uh, um, you know, these simulations. Um, the next uh, slide was uh, the videos for inclusion of anthropomorphic test devices. Um, you can see that is basically those are the similar simulation that we showed before, but now we have the dummy included. And of course, every time that we include a dummy, then we have the instrumented dummy. Now we need to include also seatbelts and airbags, which brings another limitation, right? We wanna make sure that these passive restraint systems are calibrated. Uh, we did use uh, um, passive restraint systems that we previously had calibrated against an NCAP test. Um, so you can see from uh, this simulation, these are just uh, the simulation of these two tests or these two simulation of, uh, of these two impacts between uh, the small size against the passenger vehicle uh, on the left for a small overlap and uh, also on the right for the moderate overlap. And these are just some representatives because uh, we did include uh, these dummy also in other simulation is just you know for lack of time and we went and and a lot of within this presentation we you know might have just uh, shown specific cases but um, more for illustration purposes. Um, we got to the conclusion and recommendation um, to summarize basically the results of or the conclusion of this project. Um, what we can say is that we started with uh, um, some investigation from uh, a crashworthiness compatibility um, that uh, um, was born by understanding the difference in geometry of some, not all, but some of these ADS vehicle, not occupant ADS vehicle. And sometimes again, uh, this geometry might be dictated because of the needs of the non-occupant uh, vehicle. Maybe there is no need to have a space for two occupants if it's a ADS that is only um, you know, bringing goods around. 
Um, so when we uh, when we saw these difference in geometry, that sparkled our interest in trying to investigate whether there was any maybe there wasn't any problem, you know. But if there was any problem or potential additional investigation, we can go, we can do from a trustworthiness. Uh, uh, compatibility between those vehicles and the actual passenger vehicles that are on the road. And while doing so, we look at the different impact locations and, um, oh, I'm sorry, impact scenarios. And for each one of them, uh, we look at maybe a different impact location, especially on the side one that we thought it was maybe a little more critical. And uh, the simulations seem to indicate that uh, um, we. it seems like, especially for the Interestingly enough, right, uh, for the smallest ABS vehicle, it seems like the occupant environment deformation are greater when we look into um, locations that are in between A and B pillar, rather than maybe looking into a, a B pillar engagement specifically. Um, so there are a few recommendations that uh, we would like to suggest. Uh, um, certainly, uh, the, the first thing is uh, we would like to um, really the, the very first thing would be that uh, we would like to uh, consider the use or not occupant uh, automated vehicles during the testing of the evaluation criteria and looking into potential other potential impacted locations. Uh, we started this pilot project, but doesn't mean that there might other may be other things that. Uh, um, we could or should have, you know, better investigated. Maybe our impact location that might be uh, more more critical or still critical, the same level. Um, for example, IHS uh, runs tests on the rear impact. We did not look into that. Uh, we specifically look into the side and the front. Um, the other recommendation uh, from a design of vehicle perspective is uh, maybe if if this is a if the results of this analysis uh, could be verified by some type of physical testing, maybe the best would be really a full scale crash test that shows where you know the result that we have in the simulation is actually supported um, with you know a real ABS vehicle um, and you know against a passenger vehicle. Maybe consider including crample zone in these uh, automated vehicles that don't have an occupant compartment, which at the moment, uh, a crample zone are not thought to be included because there is no occupant or no driver compartment, but that doesn't mean that maybe that's something to keep in mind for the future. Um, or also just to simply utilize some type of material that have different properties and maybe better can absorb impact forces during these impact conditions. Or simply reconsider the geometry of some, not necessarily all, but some of these non-occupant uh, automated vehicles so that uh, even in the absence of a crample zone or a minimum, the presence of a minimum crample zone, maybe we can still better redistribute the load evenly during the impact. Uh, with that said, surely our project doesn't come without limitations, uh, and that would be probably a great way to uh, potentially look into future research studies. Uh, like I mentioned before, it would be great if we are probably the first step, if we could verify the results of the simulation uh, through full-scale crash test. It doesn't have to be all of them, and maybe we can just uh, you know, take the critical one. It uh, would be great, obviously, if by doing that, we can use a, a ATD um, or even through simulation, we can use a validated ATD. Uh, when we did use uh, our dummies, instrumented dummies in the simulations, um, although they come with certain type of calibrations, we did not replicate a real case. So uh, that's, you know, the question marks on my stand there for the results of the dummy. So certainly something that can be, can be done to um, validate more the, the project's results. Um, and uh, another thing that we have not done in this project, but we didn't do purposely, it was to potentially add the effect of active safety technology, such as, for example, the automatic emergency braking. Um, just because that was not the interest that we had in our project to include those safety technologies, but um, 
since we're talking about automated vehicles that do have, you know, a certain certain level of automation, if not full automation, well, certainly would be interesting to see if these uh, if the potential inclusion of active safety technology might have an effect on, you know, these uh, these results. Uh, but again, uh, that would, would that would have to be then, uh, um, you know, verify with. Uh, uh, with some uh, full-scale testing and um, and comparison with the results of the simulation. Well, with that said, I think we came to the end of the presentation. And both me and Iruda, um, thank you so much for your attention. We are ready, Eric, to take any questions that might be there. Um, so okay. it's up to you. All right. So uh, we do have a couple of questions in the queue. Um, I'll read those first. So um, this is a question from uh, Mustafa. Uh, in the crash models on in the crash models to what extent does pavement type and friction affect the impact i.e what is worse high or low friction uh, concrete or asphalt and then the second part of that question is also what was assumed for the models uh, uh, penetration may be less but passenger injury may be worse for low friction due to jolt effect uh, great question. Thank you so much for bringing it up. So to answer the first question, uh, what type of uh, friction was used? Uh, well, we, we use, uh, you know, the area that I work in uh, is uh, investigating roadside safety devices that are implementing on roadways. So we have used the same contact definitions that uh, we normally use, uh, and uh, that would be um, basically concrete. So we did not do any detailed investigation with respect to possible different friction. That certainly would be very interested. Now keep in mind again, um, that to me that would be an, an extra, uh, certainly very interested, but an extra step into looking at uh, you know, these results. Uh, so our methodology was, well, we use the same, whatever friction we have used, but the same for all of these cases and see what happened. Results can be different with different frictions, but uh, the most important thing was to keep the same uh, uh, characteristics for all of these cases. And then the second question was with respect to, oh, well, uh, the penetration may be less, but passenger injury may be worse. So absolutely, I mean, the, the very great comment. The, um, you know, when we look at impacts, um, Normally, one thing that you always will hear from us um, that work in this area is it's great that you have the formation because that way you are um, get rid of these uh, impact energy. And so that energy is going to deform a part of the vehicles rather than actually transforming into velocity and acceleration for your body. That might be too high and then, you know, you would sustain a higher injury. The purpose, and that's absolutely true, the purpose of uh, these simulations, uh, and again, I probably should say very specifically the side one, because those are the ones that probably are more, you know, that they show us more, uh, more concerns, potentially concern. It was uh, the, the deformation of the vehicle, knowing that your person is sitting right there. You know, if you have an impact in the front or in the back, absolutely, you can argue probably the more deformation, the better technically it is. I don't want to say necessarily like that, but, you know, that's the idea that we have in mind. But when you have an impact on the, the, on the side where you, the only thing that you might have is a, a side, a side airbag that can protect you. But when you have a you know, certain level of deformation that becomes what we call intrusion, which technically might not be intrusion, it's only deformation, but it, you know, it, your, your person is sitting there. So there is obviously a higher chance that you have a direct contact with, you know, the, the vehicle impacting. So that was the purpose, really. Okay, uh, thank you. And then there's another question that was emailed, um, which is, why should we be concerned of crashworthiness compatibility of small autonomous vehicles when we already have our testing our passenger vehicles to investigate their side impact crashworthiness? Yeah, and thank you for asking this question because this really summarized the, the, the need or what well, well, we thought it was the need for this project and the scope of this project. Absolutely, the vehicles that are on the road, the passenger vehicles that are on the road are already designed and investigated 
by federal agencies uh, to determine uh, their crushworthiness, to make improvement if needed, and to then determine the crushworthiness in between these vehicles, or especially within the same category. Let's put it, you know, put it that way, like passenger vehicle with passenger vehicles. Uh, the concern really came from our perspective uh, from, again, like I mentioned before, geometry characteristic of the small autonomous vehicle. When you think of a small autonomous vehicle, when you think about a small vehicle, you may think, well, if it's a smaller, um, you know, even maybe in weight than another passenger vehicle, why should we worry about it? Well, uh, this is not just a question of weight. It's a question of uh, um, geometry. Uh, which dictate the level of engagement on the occupant compartment. And uh, also as well, let's not forget, uh, which might have an influence, uh, let's not forget uh, the distribution of the load of this vehicle. Every vehicle has a CG located somewhere. And, uh, you know, when you modify the vehicle, so when you, for example, like for the small ADS, uh, you um, apply goods more vertically, uh, then laterally, um, I don't know how to best explain, but just to give an idea, you're going to change the location of the CG. Does that affect the, uh, the crushworthiness compatibility? Uh, and so that's really what we wanted to, to start investigating. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions out there? Okay. Uh, with do you? Oh, yeah. Okay. You will definitely have um, the ability to um, ask more questions um, once we send an email out uh, to everybody for a YouTube video, and I will notify everybody by email when that's up, and I will receive C, uh, Dr. Kiara and um, Anaruda as well in that. Um, our next uh, webinar will be on sensor fusion and localization systems for improving vehicle safety in challenging weather conditions, which has a date set for March 11, 2022 at three o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And for you, registration will be open up this week. So again, thank you all for attending um, and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next one. Bye everybody. And thank you again, uh, Dr. Kiara and Anarud. Thank you, Eric. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.